Now, from the makers of Cold Water Omer... In the small reception office of Warner's answering service, a man finished working on a fuse box. He closed the box, gathered up his tools, and walked up to Warner, who was standing talking to Mrs. Peel. It ought to be all right now, Mr. Warner. Needed rewiring, that's all. Oh, splendid, Fitch, splendid, thank you. Is that an important member of your staff? Uh, no, no, he's the resident mechanic. Something of a genius. Hmm, vaguely familiar. I think I must have seen him before. Oh, I doubt it. Uh, Fitch isn't exactly social. Keeps in the background, you know, very much so. In fact, I believe that during the war, he was very much a backroom boy. <laughs> Funny fellow, you know, give him a couple of bits of wire. You'll have a shortwave radio before you can say Marconi. <laughs> oh, but I'm digressing, Mrs. Peel. What can I do for you? You supply one of your bleep devices to a friend of mine, Norman Todd Hunter. He died. I wondered if you ever got it back. Very easy way to find out, Mrs. Peel, the ledger. Warner crossed over to a counter, delved beneath it, and pulled out a large ledger. He began paging through it. Mm, meters. Thomas. True, Goody. <laughs> Fantastic name. Yep. Mm. Ah, Todd, Todd Hunter. No. No, it was never returned to us. I wonder why. The Avengers. John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers. is the wonderful new fabric conditioner that not only softens but actually rinses out hardness rinses in a new kind of softness comfort leaves your wash refreshingly young and bouncy again just a little comfort in the final rinse gives a lot of comfort to your wash softness is a thing called comfort Wall's Ice Cream presents the new Pink Pussycat song we got so bad Episode 3 of this story, in which an attempt is made to knock out John Steed. And Emma Peel realizes that someone could quite easily kill him if they were able to <laughs> dial a deadly number. John Steed found himself becoming more and more involved in the world of high finance. He got to know and impress Henry Borden and his partner, John Harvey. Boardman and Harvey were merchant bankers and completely taken in by Steed's unlimited credit and fantastic letters of recommendation. Steed had got himself a broker, Brian Frederick Yule, and made many inquiries into the business dealings of such city men as Ben Jago, who seemed to have unerring judgment when it came to investments. At a dinner party at the Boardman's, Steed arrived, in immaculate evening togs, rather early. He gazed around the penthouse suite, accepted a drink from a waiter, and turned to John Harvey. Yes, this man, Ben Jago, is amazing. The last success he had depended almost completely on the death of the company chairman. It's almost as if he knew that Todd Hunter would die. No, oh, that's fantastic. Jago is shrewd, we all know that, but that's too shrewd to be true. My reaction entirely. No. Ah, here's our host. Yes. Ah, Steed. Good evening to you. Uh, Steed, I don't think you've been introduced to my wife. No, I haven't had that pleasure. Uh, Ruth, uh, Ruth, my dear, this is Mr. John Steed. How do you do? I'm delighted to meet you. Thank you. You are going into business with my husband. Well, let's say he's showing me the ropes. Oh, you are not in the city. 
Not often. And uh, let me borrow Mr. Steed. There is someone I would like him to meet. Oh, pleasure. That's the beauty of parties. One's always meeting people. It's a small world, Mrs. Boardman, isn't it? Ah, so they say, Mr. Steed. So they say. Ruth Boardman linked her arm casually through John Steed's and led him across the room to where a beautiful young woman was talking to a group of solemn-faced, white-haired men. My dear, this is Mr. Steed, another non-financial animal. Uh, Mr. Steed, Mrs. Emma Peel. Delighted to meet you, Mrs. Peel. Good evening, Mr. Steed. Uh, my dear, is dinner in ten minutes, all right? Oh, I, I will go and sit about it. Mrs. Peel is another of our clients from Barbados. She arrived recently. Recently? I arrived last week. You surprise me. Oh, why is that? Oh, so little tan. It's the rainy season. Ah, oh, yes, of course. Excuse me, Mr. Boardman, you have to make a telephone call. Ah, uh, uh, yes, yes, uh, please excuse me. Don't be long now, dear. It's your idea to eat early. I admire your view. Views over penthouse, of course. Oh, it is pleasant, isn't it? Restricting, but it is better for Henry. He can have a rubber of bridge at his club and still be home for dinner. You've given up the country house? Ah, alas, yes. Um, oh, would you excuse me again? I won't be a moment, but Henry is so fussy about the temperature of his wine. Mm. Well, rainy season indeed. Well, it's true. The annual average, 36 inches, half of which falls between September and November. Next question... How long do we have to wait for the rest of the guests? I'm starving. One guest at the party was late. It was Yule, the broker. He knew it would be impossible for him to go home and change, and so he'd brought an evening tuxedo along to his office. He washed and changed swiftly, whistling as he did so. It was while he was fastidiously buttoning up the buttons of his waistcoat that he realized it was rather a tight fit. He was puzzled to find something sewn into the top pocket. What the devil? It's a bleeper! No! No! You all tore at the waistcoat, ripping the buttons in an attempt to get free, but the bleep went off. <laughs> you all clutched at his chest and fell across the desk, a death exactly like that of Todd Hunter's. the dinner party had proceeded to the coffee, brandy and cigar stage. There was one place, Yule's, which remained empty and untouched. Uh, uh, typical. A uh, fine broker, but his manners are atrocious. Oh, shh. There may be some logical explanation. Mm, I was right about the wine, wasn't I, Mr. Steve? Oh, indeed, yes, Mr. Harvey. And I adore your sherry. And the brandy, impeccable. I thought brandies were judicious. Uh, not according to the authorized text. Oh, are you interested in wines, Mrs. Peel? In moderation, Mr. Harvey. I was referring to your interest, not your capacity. So was I. We have a wine tasting at the bank cellar next Tuesday. If you'd care to come along, Mrs. Beale. I should be delighted. Yeah, perhaps Mr. Steed would care to attend, too. Steed produced a miniature pocket diary immediately. <clears throat> Let me see. You'll say um, Tuesday next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Lady Smith relieved 1900. The diary is a lovesome thing. That's fine. What time? Six o'clock. We'll see how keen your palate really is. Well, in which case, if I may, I'll leave you and go into strict training. Just as you wish, Mr. Steed. Uh, Mrs. Peel, can I drop you somewhere? No, 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 no. You're not going to deprive us of Mrs. Peel's company. Oh, we will see she gets home safe. Yes. I have my own car. Oh, well, I'll say good night then. And many, many thanks for your hospitality. Thank you, Mr. Steed. Good night. Good night. Steed had parked his car in the garage of the basement. It was very dark. Steed's footsteps echoed hollowly as he tried to locate the parking bay. Steed walked jauntily forward, still smoking his cigar. Then he stopped. That's strange. Cigarette stub. Still smoldering. We are not alone. Steed unbuttoned his evening jacket and reached for his gun. At that moment... Round, the headlights of what appeared to be a large car flashed onto him. The headlights separated as two motorcycles roared down the length of the garage. Steed dodged the first bike. The sinister rider, clothed all in black leather and goggles, skidded round. The second made for Steed, lying on the ground. 
Steed threw himself aside in the nick of time. His gun fell from his hand. The bike seemed to be coming at him from all directions. Steed, caught in the lights, made a perfect target. The first bike returned to the attack. Steed whipped off his evening cape and threw it over the head of the cyclist. Blinded, the driver lost control, smashing into a packing crate. Steed sprinted for his fallen gun. The second rider swerved and headed to cut him off. Steed got to the gun, fell forward and fired at the approaching headlight. The headlight went out, but somehow the rider managed to regain control. He roared up the concrete ramp, his footrest striking a shower of sparks. He managed to avoid the doorpost and hurtled away into the dark. Steed recovered his breath, moved to his car and snapped on its spotlight. Mrs. Peel's voice said, Pistol practice at this time of the night? Is he dead? Steve looked down at the body of the motorcyclist. Broken neck by the look of it. Dangerous sport, motorcycling. Well, let's take a closer look at him. Steve bent down and removed the dead man's helmet. Hmm. Far cry from sherry and biscuits. He was a waiter. Yules, I think. The boardmans were pretty anxious that you shouldn't leave with me, weren't they? Well, you think that they're in... Yes. Yes, indeed. They didn't want you butting in on a little surprise they'd prepared for me. You're guessing. Well, I know that. Well, now what? Go back and confront them with this? No. No, I think that first, uh, I'd better have a word with my broker. Right. Shall we go, Steed? I really think you need a bodyguard this evening. Applying for the job. If the pay's all right. Well, pay's not good, but I'll make sure there's plenty of perks. Let's go. <laughs> A short while after that, with the aid of his skeleton keys, Steed obtained entrance to Yule's offices. Yule's body now lay on its back. Papers were scattered all over the room. Steed examined the body thoroughly. <sighs> Look, Mrs. Peel, waistcoat pocket. Ripped away completely. Yes, that's really what you call having your pocket picked. And no wonder he didn't feel like dinner. But he was planning to come. Those clothes. He was dressing and... And then. Not the usual old heart attack this time. For a rough guess, I'd say he'd been dead about three hours. Hmm. Spoken like an expert. Oh, I've been taking a refresher course in applied medicine. As a matter of fact, when you called me so urgently to join you on this case, I I was... interrupted your studies. Never mind. Gives you a chance to put the theory into practice, doesn't it? A chance I could have done without. But I'll take a small side bet with you, Steed. Even the old champagne supper. But there's a slight bruise over this dead man's heart. Any bets? What is this new kind of cleanness women are discovering for their dishes? It's sunlight cleanness. What sunlight cleanness? A fresh, sparkling cleanness you've never known before. Why fresh? New sunlight liquid has real lemon juice. And sparkling? Sunlight liquid is concentrated. It's got the greatest grease-cutting power to give you sparkling dishes every time. And new sunlight liquid with real lemon juice means real economy. Just one teaspoonful washes a whole sinkful of dishes sparkling clean. Sunlight clean. There's just no dirt that can stand up to the cleaning power of cold water Omo. Mrs. Gray of Durban has this to say. Uh, I can't even explain it. it. It astounded me. I was really and truly very astounded. Once an Omo user, always an Omo user. The Avengers. Listen every evening, Monday to Friday, to John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers, brought to you by the makers of Cold Water Omos.